Chapter 21, Savior Today, in the town of David, a Savior is born, Luke. The notion that a special person can be born as a baby and grow up to be the Savior of the people is another idea that has been held in diverse lands and at various times. The Hindu god Vishnu came to the earth, at least a portion of him, and incarnated in the flesh in order to save humanity. It is believed that he has done this nine times in this eon, and that he will come once again before it is over. Each of these emanations of Vishnu is called an avatar. The first avatar of Vishnu was Matsya, a fishman that warned Manu to save humanity and animals from the coming flood. We have shown the parallel in the Mesopotamian flood myth where Enki saves human life. Of interest here is the fact that Enki was also depicted at times as a fishman. The next avatar of Vishnu, called Kurma, came to keep balance in the universe when the Asura gods and the Deva gods were fighting for the elixir of life. The third avatar was Varaha, a boar-headed man that returned the earth to her place in the cosmos after a thousand-year battle with Hiranyaksha. By restoring the earth, Varaha saved all life that lives on it. The next avatar is shown as a lion-headed man that came to destroy a very powerful tyrant. At another time, the sky god Indra was monopolizing the power of three worlds which caused some lower gods to ask Vishnu for help. Vishnu came as a dwarf and tricked Indra into relinquishing his power over earth and the netherworld. The next avatar was Parashurama, a warrior saint. He committed the unsaintly act of slaughtering the entire ruling class of India and leaving pools of their blood spilt on the ground. It is said that Parashurama is still alive in the Mahendagiri mountains, paying penance for this act. An immortal avatar of Vishnu. Maybe you will meet him someday. Though that emanation of Vishnu lived on, others came as well, whenever God saw the need to send a savior. Next came Rama, of the famous Ramayana epic, where his wife Sita is captured by a bad god and in turn saved by Rama. The eighth avatar of Vishnu is especially relevant to our current topic. Without the aid of a mortal man, Vishnu entered the womb of Devaka, who gave birth to a baby with bluish-gray skin named Krishna. Like the Greek god Hermes, Krishna did his fair share of tricks on others while yet a baby. Herding cows and playing the flute are some other traits that Krishna shares with Hermes. But in his role as a savior, Krishna saved a village from a many-headed serpent that poisoned the waters. Like Hercules and the Hydra, Krishna defeated the serpent. He danced on the head of the snake, striking the skull with the soles of his feet. This may remind us of the words of Yahweh to the serpent in Genesis. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Even in the stars, we see the constellation of Ophiuchus, a man whose foot lays on the head of the serpent, Scorpio, yet his heel is open to be stung by a venomous attack. In the Iliad, Achilles fights as a hero, but is struck by a poisonous arrow in his heel. Krishna saved another village by raising a mountain. According to Jesus, this can be done with enough faith. Krishna had many wives, but his principal wife was Radha. Radha is an avatar of Lakshmi, the consort of Vishnu. Thus, this divine couple is connected on higher planes as well as lower ones. Lord Krishna acted as savior again when he cast demons out of the land. His life ended when he was killed by an arrow or spear. In some versions, this happened while he was hung on a tree. In another, the arrow pierced his feet. Similarly, the Norse god Odin hung himself on a tree and pierced his side with a spear as a sacrifice to gain wisdom. After death, Krishna ascended above the Deva gods to his abode in Goloka, star planet. Goloka is the center of the Vaikuntha planets, where liberated souls go. In the Markandeya Purana, Krishna assures us that he will return by saying, In the Kali Yuga, I will leave Goloka and, to save the people of the world, I will become the handsome and playful Lord Gauranga. It is said that Buddha was the ninth avatar of Vishnu and that the tenth will be called Kalki. Kalki rides a white horse and wields a blazing sword. 
He is called the destroyer of filth. This links with Revelations 19.11. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, and its rider is called Faithful and True. With righteousness he judges and wages war. He has eyes like blazing fire. Those of us that were raised in Christian culture hear the word Savior, and instantly our mind goes to thoughts of Jesus Christ, who is called the Savior of the world. But what exactly do we need saving from? Is it monsters, natural disasters, or our own shortcomings? In the myths, there are heroes and saviors that save humanity from all of these. But Jesus was about saving on a physical as well as a spiritual level. A Book of Mormon verse reads, Oh, how great the goodness of our God, who prepareth a way for our escape from the grasp of this awful monster, yea, that monster, death and hell, which I call the death of the body and also the death of the spirit. 2 Nephi 9.10 If physical death is the separation of the spirit from the body, spiritual death is the separation of the soul from God. It is believed that Jesus overcame spiritual death through his suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross of Calvary. In some mystical way, he paid the price for everyone's karmic debts. Max Heindel gave an illustration to reconcile the ideas of the saving effects of Christ's atonement and personal karma. He begins by describing the quick rapids of the Niagara River just before the falls, the point of no return. Suppose a man appeared who, in pity for the victims of the current, placed a rope above the cataract, although he knew that the conditions were such that in doing so he himself could not by any possible chance escape death. Yet gladly, and of his own free will, he sacrificed his life and placed the rope, thus modifying former conditions so that any otherwise helpless victims who would grasp the rope would be saved and thenceforth none need be lost. In this example, Help is available for people that made the mistake of going too far, and through Christ all can take advantage of saving grace, or they can pay their own way. Thus the ongoing debate about whether one is saved by works or grace is solved. It is by both. We must believe and act. Christians believe that Jesus overcame physical death when he rose from the tomb. All who die will be born again. Call it resurrection or reincarnation. It is a cycle of death and rebirth. We will return to this topic later. For now, let us discuss some lesser-known aspects of Jesus. Jesus was called Yeshua in his native language. It is the same name that was given to Moses' successor, Joshua, and it means to rescue or deliver. The longer Yehoshua or Yahushua means cry to Yahweh for help or Yahweh saves. Some say that the English Jesus comes from the Greeks combining the Hebrew god Jehovah or Jah with their own Zeus to make Jesus. It was common practice for the Greeks to combine head gods of other cultures with Zeus, like Zeus Amun from Egypt and Zeus Adados from Canaan. As noted earlier, when the Hebrew letter Shin is added to the letters for Yahweh, it can read as Yeshua. Now, some say that the Word became flesh when Jesus was born. Others think that the Christ entered into the body of Jesus when he was baptized or when he was transfigured on the mount. In any case, Jesus was born on earth with a mission to save others. Jesus understands every weakness and sorrow because he has experienced them all. Did he gain all of that experience in 30 years? I think not. How could he know how a soldier felt who spent all his days in battle, or a woman in the oppressive male-dominated society? The answer, I believe, is that Jesus spent many lives learning from experience and perfecting himself. Jesus was not yet perfectly developed when he was born to Mary. The Gospels tell us that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. Luke 2.51 Like the avatars of Vishnu, the man Jesus came to earth many times to help humanity. Each life may have been an emanation of the Christ consciousness. The idea that Jesus perfected himself through many lives was held by Christian mystics such as H. Spencer Lewis, Max Heindel, and Edgar Cayce. They have given lists of various Old Testament prophets like Adam, Joshua, and Elijah, or 
religious founders like Zoroaster and Siddhartha Gautama Buddha. While in a trance, Casey was asked, When did the knowledge come to Jesus that he was to be the savior of the world? Casey responded, When he fell in Eden. Jesus as Adam or Son of Adam Jesus is called the Savior and Redeemer of humankind. Normally, we use the word redeem or redemption when one has made a mistake and later makes up for that mistake in some way, thereby redeeming themselves. Jewish myth tells us that humans are in a fallen state because of the acts of Adam. So who should be the one to redeem us but Adam? This line of reasoning gives credit to the idea that Adam incarnated many times before he was born as Jesus. Casey names Amelius as the Atlantean incarnation of the man that later came to earth as Adam, then Enoch Hermes, Melchizedek, Joseph of Egypt, Joshua the warrior priest of Israel, Asaph the musician, Joshua the high priest in Ezra, Zend the father of Zoroaster, then Jesus the savior. Like Adam, Jesus is called the Son of God. He is also called the Second Adam. Like the Avatar Krishna, Christ told his disciples that he would return before the great and last day. He may come as a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. Or maybe the waters of everlasting life have kept his physical body alive and he will return in a kind of spaceship or beam of light. Rather than Amelius, Mormons give the name Michael to the individual that later incarnated as Adam. According to Brigham Young, Adam is God the Father and the one who came down and impregnated Mary. That would make Jesus a generation of Adam rather than an incarnation of him. But it was Adam that brought humans to this corrupted state, so it was up to him to redeem us. Joseph Smith wrote in the LDS Articles of Faith, we believe that all men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgressions. Why should Jesus pay for his dad's disobedience? I personally find it more logical to say that Jesus and Adam are the same being. In either case, we are dealing with gods or otherworldly beings that descended or fell to earth. The angel Michael fell when he disobeyed and was cursed to till the earth. The angel Lucifer fell when he rebelled. The angel Azazel fell when he bred with a woman from earth. In fact, this was the sin in all three cases, an unlawful union. Jesus descended below all things in order to redeem the human race. The implication is that these may all be stories of the same person. Whether Jesus, Adam, Lucifer, and Azazel are all the same being or not, they each had a divine father named Yahweh. Jesus was first called the Son of God when he brought his disciples to Mount Hermon, the home of Azazel and the Watchers. What god was he the son of? It should be remembered that the Canaanites worshipped gods that lived on Mount Hermon called the Elohim. The physical incarnation of Jesus of Nazareth was fathered by a god that fell and later became a redeemer. For the Savior himself said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. John 5.19 Although Young stated that Adam is the God that fathered Jesus, he also declared that Adam was the son of another God. That God would be the grandfather of Jesus. One interpretation of the LDS Temple Endowment is that the three gods, Elohim, Jehovah, and Michael, are three generations, father, son, and grandson. After receiving opposition for his views on Adam, Young said, it is no matter whether we are to consider him our God, or whether his father or his grandfather, for in either case we are of one species, of one family, and Jesus Christ is also of our species. So Young was right when he said Adam was God, because Adam and Jesus are the same entity. The being that fathered the bodies of both Adam and Jesus was the god Jehovah. Types and Shadows Patriarchs of the Old Testament are at least types of Jesus the archetype, if not earlier incarnations of him. Melchizedek and Jesus were both called the Son of Man, had miraculous births, were kings in Jerusalem, called King of Peace and Prince of Peace, and held the High Priesthood. 
Joseph was sold for silver by one of the twelve sons of Jacob named Judah. Jesus was sold for silver by one of the twelve apostles named Judas. Joseph spent three days in a pit. Jesus spent three days in a tomb. Jonah three days in a whale. Joseph saved the Egyptians and their neighbors from a famine, and Jesus saved the people from a spiritual famine as the bread of life. Joshua saved Israel by raising his hands. Jesus saved the world by being raised on the cross. Adam fell in a garden. Jesus paid the price in the garden of Gethsemane. Adam partook of the fruit of a tree and brought death into the world. Jesus was hung on a tree and thus brought life to the world. Adam fell asleep and awoke to his soulmate Eve. Jesus died and rose to meet Mary Magdalene, whom he loved. Holy Blood I will add here that Casey believed that Adam became Jesus and that Eve became Mary, the mother of Jesus, but the parallels between Jesus and Adam that were depicted on the barnward doors in Germany give the less disturbing comparison of Adam and Eve with Jesus and Mary Magdalene. From India we have the story of Vishnu and Lakshmi that came to earth as Krishna and Radha. From Israel we have Adam and Eve that return as Jesus and Mary. Yes, Jesus was married. It was common in his day for a rabbi to marry before preaching to followers. Just before Jesus began his ministry, he performed the miracle of turning water into wine at a wedding in Cana. Interestingly, it was his mother Mary that was in charge of the wedding. The Jewish custom was that the mother of the groom should be in charge of serving the guests. So Mary and Jesus were not just hanging out at some random wedding, it was the wedding feast for Jesus and his bride. Long before the Da Vinci Code, LDS prophets were talking about Jesus being married, not only to Mary of Magdala, but to Mary and Martha and others as well. They also spoke of him fathering children and of his bloodline. It is not official church doctrine, but Joseph Smith Jr., Brigham Young, George Q. Cannon, Joseph F. Smith, Lorenzo Snow, and others have all declared it to be the truth. In one such case, Joseph Fielding Smith was asked if Jesus was married and had children, to which he replied, Yes, but do not preach it. The Lord advised us not to cast pearls before a swine. Wilford Woodruff wrote a journal entry about his second anointing, which reads, Ruth anointed my feet and wiped them with the hair of her head, then kissed them after the pattern as written in the testament of the Lord Jesus Christ. This secret ordinance is given to select married couples, and the insinuation here is that Mary, the sister of Martha, was performing a marriage ritual that gave her the right to claim Jesus as her husband in the next life. There is nothing wrong with a righteous man or the most righteous man joining in marriage and fathering children. In fact, I can think of nothing more dignified. Of course, as he was half God, his children would be a quarter, and so on. Some may scoff at the LDS bloodline claims, but we all have some of Jesus' blood in our veins, as well as that of Abraham, Noah, and Adam. This is because humans like to breed, and the population has gone from few to billions. Therefore, we can all join with the legendary King Arthur in saying, I am the Holy Grail, because we share royal blood. Speaking of the Grail, after the Last Supper, Jesus was crucified on Golgotha. The name Golgotha means place of the skull, and was thus named because of a legend that the skull of Adam was buried there. When Christ's blood fell to the earth on the spot, it connected the second Adam with the first and completed the fall and redemption of humankind. Now, according to LDS and Jewish Kabbalah teachings, Adam had more than one wife. The other patriarchs, such as Abraham, Jacob, David, and Solomon, also practiced polygamy. The practice was passed on from Israel to Islam. But the only Christians that took it up, besides Christ himself, were the early Mormons, some of whom claimed to descend from Jesus and the apostles. Jesus met another woman at a well, the story of which is significant because many prophets before him met their wife at a well, leading one to believe that she too became a wife of Jesus. Lord Krishna met his closest wife Radha at a riverside while she was gathering water. The parallels are many, but we must move on. Heroes 
Buddhists believe that the Buddha has come to earth many times in order to guide humanity, which of course parallels the incarnations of Jesus and the avatars of Vishnu. But there are other saviors in myth called heroes. Rather than guide evolution with teachings, the heroes save by using their strength and cunning. Many Jews did not accept Jesus as their Messiah, anointed one, because they are waiting for a war hero that will take out all their enemies, someone more like the Greek Achilles or Heracles. Heracles, or Hercules in Rome, synchronizes with Jesus in that he was half mortal and half god, and his father is the king of the gods. Hercules was known for his strength, and among his adventures were the twelve labors in which he captured or killed various ferocious animals. He killed a lion with his bare hands. The Jewish version has Samson as the one with superhuman strength that tears apart a lion with his hands. And from Mesopotamia it is Gilgamesh. The labors of Hercules may have reference to the twelve zodiacal signs. The twelve apostles of Jesus may as well. Hercules journeyed to the underworld and returned alive. Jesus also went to the land of the dead and returned alive. The Germans equated Hercules with Thor, son of Odin. From Hercules and his various consorts came a number of different bloodlines. The Scythians, Spartans, and Macedonians all claimed to descend from Hercules. As a savior, Hercules did more than kill monsters. He is the one that freed Prometheus from his chains. This is the message from Zeus that was delivered to Prometheus while he was chained to the earth. Look for no term to such an agony, till there stand forth among the gods one who shall take upon him thy sufferings, and consent to enter hell far from the light of sun, yea, the deep pit and murk of Tartarus, for thee. Hercules fulfilled that prophecy, and freed Prometheus from his chains. At the death of his body, the soul of Hercules ascended to Olympus, where he joined the gods. Thus Hercules graduated from hero or demigod to a god. Another hero fathered by Zeus was Hercules' great-grandfather, Perseus. Perseus beheaded Medusa and saved Andromeda from a sea monster. He also escaped being killed as a baby by being placed in a wooden chest in the water, similar to Moses in the basket on the Nile. The Greeks equated Hercules with a ram-headed Egyptian god named Herishaph. They also equated him with Melkart, the Phoenician lord of the city Tyre, said to be the ancestor of the royal family in Tyre. The fame of Hercules spread around the world and, because of his strength and importance, people linked him with various sky gods and war gods like Vajrapani, the Buddha's powerful guard, Bahram, Varathragna, the Zoroastrian god of victory and virility, who came to earth in ten different forms, mostly animals, was also linked with Hercules. Varathragna has been equated with many sky and war gods of various cultures. These gods are heroes to those they fight for and are feared by the enemy. Divine Twins Many saviors and heroes in myth have a twin. Hercules actually had a twin brother named Iphicles. Krishna had a brother named Balarama. They shared the same mother, but not the same father. Balarama was known for his strength, and some traditions believe him to be an incarnation of the serpent that Vishnu rests on. The main characters in the Maya Popol Vuh are the hero twins Unapu and Shivalanke. These two journeyed to the underworld and defeated the lords of death. They also liked to play the Mayan ball game Pits. For the Aztecs, the hero twins are Quetzalcoatl and Xolotl. The hero twins of the Hopi and Navajo tribes defeat a giant and a monster like the Maya, Unapu, and Chivalanque. The Dioscuri, or Gemini, are Roman twins who share the same mother, but one is fathered by Jupiter and the other is not. The same scenario occurred with Hercules and Iphicles. In Greece and Rome, the Dioscuri are called Castor and Pollux. In England, Hengist and Horsa. In India, the Ashvins. The Ashvins were said to bring the light of morning and evening. They are Aspa in Avestan, Ashvienai in Lithuanian, and Daiva Delhi in Latvian. There are many more examples. In each case, they are fathers of nations, horse riders, and conquerors. The namesake of Rome comes from its mythical founder Romulus, whose twin was Remus. Twins play important roles in the Torah, too. Of Jacob and Esau, 
Yahweh said to Rebekah, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Though not twins, a type can be seen in the brothers Isaac and Ishmael, or Cain and Abel, who, according to some, shared the same mother but different fathers. We come now to brothers that represent opposite sides, an evil twin and a good twin. A good example comes from the Persian myth of Zorvan, who was neutral and indifferent when he bore two sons, Ahura Mazda, the good twin, and Angra Mainyu, the evil twin. They are necessary opposites like yin and yang, like the Kabbalistic idea that all things, both good and bad, come from God, some from his right hand and some from his left. The Savior, Jesus Christ, has been called our elder brother and, according to some Christians, he is also the brother of Lucifer. Jesus, who is Michael and Adam, said, I am the light, and Lucifer means light bringer. Lucifer is used in the Bible as a name for the morning star, the dawn bringer. Jesus said of himself, I am the bright and morning star. Though these two fallen angels of light bear the title of morning star, they can be different beings. For in Job 38.7, we read that before the creation of the world, the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. There were two morning stars. The planets on either side of Earth are Venus and Mars, and, like Jesus and Satan, both have been called the morning star. It is interesting that Venus is the goddess of love, and Mars is the god of war. These two red planets represent opposite aspects. Satan, the son of the morning, was cast down to earth. In the words of Isaiah, he was cut to the earth and thrown in the pit that holds the spirits of the dead, called Shul. In the New Testament, Jesus liberated the captives from their chains in Tartarus by preaching to them after his death. Just as Hercules released Prometheus from his chains, Jesus brought the light of truth to free all of us rebellious souls from darkness. Satan was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. We are those fallen angels, and Jesus is our Savior. Our fallen state on earth is a necessary step for the evolution of our souls. This life of duality is a great place to learn. We experience the bitter and the sweet. In the words of the Book of Mormon, Adam fell that men might be, and men are that they might have joy. Savior gods that said they would return in the future include Krishna to the Indians, Jesus to the Israelites, Kukulkan to the Maya, Quetzalcoatl to the Aztecs, Viracocha to the Inca, Awanis to the Babylonians, Thor to the Norse, and the elder white brother Pahana who promised to return to the Hopi people. Other prophesied saviors expected to come are the Zoroastrian god Shaushant, the Buddhist Maitreya, the Hindu Kalki, and the Greek goddess Astraea.